challenges. So today our guest speaker is Angela Torres. Angela, I'm gonna say hello really quickly and I'm gonna read your bio. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for coming. I know you could either be playing video games or chatting with your friends, but you've decided to come here, so I'm very grateful. <laughs> okay, so Angela is the author of Blood Orange, winner of Willow Books Literature Award for Poetry. Her second collection, What Happens in Neither, in Neither is forthcoming from Four Way Books, March 2021, and To the Bone from Sundress Publications in March 2020. Uh, her recent Work appears in Poetry, Missouri Review, Quarterly West, Cortland Review, and Pink. She is a graduate of Warren Milson MFA program for Winters and Harvard Graduate Schools of Education. Um, she serves as a senior and reviews editor in reviews editor for Rhino Poetry. And this is Angela. Hi everyone. Again, I'm so happy to be here and I'm really grateful to have a chance to talk to you about what I love the most, which is writing. All right, so the title of my talk is Do What You Love, But Do The Work Too and The Rest Will Follow. And it's not really a talk. I really want this to be more like a casual conversation because I feel that really all of what we do in life is evolving. It's a work of art. It's a process. And um, even in my own life, deciding my career path to become the writer that I am today just was a, a really long and windy kind of a process. It wasn't something that was predetermined from the start. Um, I know you guys are all thinking about your careers and what, 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 um, what the future will hold for you. And it can be a very scary time. And I know when I was 16 or 17, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. My parents wanted me to be a doctor because they were in the medical field. My brother said, get into computer science because everybody's doing but for me I really um, I wasn't really sure I could I, I felt I could do almost anything there was so much possibility for me but there was also um, this fear that if I chose the wrong thing then I'd be stuck in a in life that I didn't that wasn't for me you know what I wish I knew when I was your age I wish I had known what I heard in my son's orientation in college um, the, the the speaker had asked all the parents like how many of you are in the career that you studied in college? And maybe three people raised their hand in the room of 50, 60, 75 parents. So really, it really doesn't matter what college degree you end up with because life will throw curveballs at you. There will be new things coming in your path and your decisions will slowly lead you to where your passion is. At least that's what I believe. Um, coming out of high school, I didn't think I'd be a full-time writer. I thought that I would um, be somewhere in the health fields because my parents were. But when, when the college apps opened and I was trying to decide, I, I, I just somehow didn't feel right about choosing a medical degree. And it so happened my college opened the computer science program and my, my, my brother said, why don't you take that? That's the wave of the future. Uh, it's new, it's exciting. So I did that and I quickly learned after one semester that it wasn't for me because I was really bored and I was like not doing the work. So I decided, I spoke to an aunt of mine who taught had a preschool of her own and worked with young children. And we talked a little bit and she said, you know what? I think that you really need a field that's more humanizing, just knowing who the person you are. So I ended up in psychology and long story short, I graduated from psychology and I decided to work with young children because I felt that that was the population I could serve best. I taught preschool for a year at my aunt's school. And then a year later, I decided to go to the US. To, I, live in the, I lived in the Philippines then. I'm Filipino and my family lived back there. Then I did my college there. So I went to the US to pursue a master's in counseling at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and focusing on early childhood education. And from there, I thought I really want to serve um, underserved populations, like children who have emotional difficulties, who have maybe psych psych psychological problems. And so that's where I focused my studies. And after I graduated, I decided I would work first teaching preschool because I loved working with young kids. But in the afternoons, I did an internship with um, an emotional, a, a preschool for emotionally disturbed children. And I got to know that population too. And I, I just was really um, convinced that my dream was to open a clinic back in the Philippines for emotionally disturbed children. Um, so shortly after um, my stint teaching in, uh, in the Cambridge area with the, uh, preschoolers, I moved to Tucson, Arizona to be with my then fiance. And I started working with 
uh, underprivileged kids in a foster care system. So using my counseling degree, counseling their family, their foster families and these children who had, you know, had really difficult lives. You know, they were in the foster care system because they had been neglected, they had been abused. And that was really being in the trenches. That was a lot of hard work emotionally for me. I learned a lot and I learned a lot about um, counseling families and helping them integrate a new child into their home and helping them thrive in, in society. But it was also very draining. So fast forward a year later, I got married to my fiance and we were living in Austin, Texas. And together we decided that that kind of work might be a little bit too emotionally draining for me to be raising a family as well. So I went back to teaching preschool and then we had our first child. And um, as soon as he was about a year old, we both decided that it would be okay for me to stay home and be a full-time mother because it really didn't make sense for us to pay for daycare for me to go to work in a daycare. So I just stayed home with my son and my husband worked. And, you know, I embraced the career of being a full-time mom at that time. And it was, and believe me, it is a full-time job and it is a worthy job, which doesn't get enough respect and uh, I think uh, acknowledgement, but it's, it's also a good choice. It's not a choice my own mother made. She was a full-time medical practitioner, but it's a choice I made for my children. Anyway, um, eventually I went back to counseling when my second child was a year old and I worked part-time in a school in San Jose. I was working as a school counselor and that was very good. I did play therapy with the children who needed help there. But anyway, all this to say that, see, there are all these circuitous routes to becoming who you really were meant to be. And when my third child was born, I realized I will stay home full time. I will raise my kids. But I also want to fulfill my own dreams as a, as a human being, as an artist, as a person. And that's when I started writing. I decided to start writing when I, my youngest turned two years old and we were living in the Philippines then because my husband's job made him travel a lot and we often went along with him. He was sent back to the Philippines to open an office there. He works in IT and computer computers and he sets up computer systems for large companies. So in the Philippines, one day I was reading the paper and a friend of mine had written a column in the paper and I thought, wow, this is really beautifully written. It's about motherhood. It's about her experience as a mother. And I could do this. I could write. I could, I could easily write about my own experiences as a mother. And um, I've always loved writing. I've always loved books. So the year after that, we went back to the U.S., I decided to start taking classes in writing, only in the evenings, because in the, the daytime, I was taking care of my kids. They were going off to school. But in the evenings, at least once a week, I could go to the community college and take classes in writing. And I remember the first class I took, it was called Creative Writing, The First Step. And the teacher had taught two weeks of nonfiction, two weeks of fiction, and two weeks of poetry. And I did okay in the nonfiction. I could not write any short stories to save my life. I was really bad at writing fiction. And then when we got to the poetry, the teacher said, you're a poet, you should be writing poetry. And I was surprised because I never really thought that that was my genre. I always thought I'd be writing personal essays about motherhood, about growing up in the Philippines. So anyway, I, I took her words to heart. I started writing more poetry, taking more classes uh, uh, in the evenings. We were living in the San Francisco Bay Area then, and there were classes through the UC schools and through Stanford that you would take in the evenings, and they were fairly affordable for people who worked. And I realized that I really did love writing poetry, and I read everything I could, journals, magazines, books, library books. Library book sales are great for finding cheap used books. And I started sending my work out. Um, one challenge was that it's hard to be a person of color trying to break into the North American literary landscape because it's obviously dominated by the white population. Um, mostly white men are editors of books, of anthologies, of journals. I mean, that's slowly changing, but to be a woman and a woman of color trying to write in the US is very challenging. So. Um, you just have to be really smart. You need to pick your market. I remember one of the first places I submitted was the Asian American Pacific Journal. And um, they were looking for writing from Asian Americans and I submitted there and it got accepted. It was one of my first acceptances. 
And then I just started like befriending teachers and co-writers uh, co who were Asian and asked them how they, they made their way in the world and eventually got invited to do readings, to be part of anthologies. Um, and it kind of snowballed from there. And eventually I decided um, to become more serious about it and get an MFA in creative writing. Um, and I know it sounds like I, I wasted my counseling degree to, to some people, but it's really something that's informed the way I raised my children and informed my writing as well. Um, and so, yeah, I did my MFA. And what's really interesting about doing an, a master in fine arts and creative writing is there's an option now to do a low residency program. So even if you're working full time or raising a family, you can do a low residency program, which means you would go to the school where you're studying with your teachers. Everyone meets there in January and in June, twice a year. And for 10 days, you're immersed in that community, taking lectures, doing workshop, etc. Then you're matched with your instructor and you start corresponding by email or by the post and send each other poems. And then the teacher will write back their feedback and just goes back and forth like that. So in that way, I got my MFA in two years. And shortly after that, published my first book. Um, not too shortly, actually. <laughs> it took me almost, let's see, I graduated 2009, and this came out in 2013, Blood Orange, my first book, which is a book about my growing up years in the Philippines and my eventual move to the US as an adult. So it's like a poetic memoir. And it got published through a contest, because usually with poetry, it's really, really hard to break into the publishing world. But the the most common way is you join a contest that a publisher will put out, and if you win the contest, they will publish the book and give you, hopefully, some prize money too. And um, then they'll invite you to do readings. And it just so happened that Willow Books, my publisher, had opened their contest that year to all people of color. They used to mostly publish only Afri African-American poets, but that, the, that year they were open to all people of color. So I submitted, and my book got chosen. And I'm just really thankful because it really just takes one person to champion your work because there are so many good writers, so many good artists out there. But for you to break into the world of art or, or literature or music, somebody has to pull for you and say, yes, this person is, is good. Listen to them, hear their work. And that's how networking in a writing community, such as an MFA program, or even just your community, going to readings, going to events, literary events, exhibits, that's how those things become valuable because you meet people and they, they direct you as to where to go. Um, later, I'll give you some specific tips, but for now, I just want to open up. If anyone has any questions before I go on to my, the next thing I wanna talk about, is there anything that you want to ask me at this point? I'm open to questions. Oh, and here's the next slide showing pictures of my book and Rhino, a magazine that I helped edit. Are there any questions at this point? I'd love to hear Not from you. Not just yet. You guys have questions? Go ahead and type them in the chat. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for them to actually type up everything. Yeah. It's fine. I mean, I'll just keep talking. I feel like I'm talking so much. I'm okay, so one, one actually came up. So since pursuing a career in the arts um, is usually looked down upon, especially from parents in the older generation, because it is seen as an unstable job, how mm -hmm. would you convince the skeptical that this is a valid career path? Good question. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's from Vanessa. That's an excellent question, Vanessa. I mean, com coming from an Asian family, I can definitely relate with that. My parents were very skeptical that I had given up my counseling career to become a full-time mom and then a full-time writer. But, you know, everyone's path is different. And I guess in my case, I was lucky that my husband and I had decided that we, were, we would be able to support a family with me staying home with the kids and him working. But I've seen other people in the writing career, in my writing career, uh, who have made it work. Most of the writers I know work um, as teachers or librarians or work in the community as a, giving workshops and working for organizations and arts organizations. I even have one of my mentors is actually a physician. He's a full-time radiation oncologist. He, he works with cancer patients. And he told me that when he graduated from college, he 
actually deferred his medical degree because he also got accepted into a writing program. He did that first, and when he finished that, he went and did his master's, uh, his, his med medical um, studies. And he pursued that full-time, he works full-time, and every Wednesday he would teach from his home in that MFA program I thought, told you about. He, he was my teacher there. So there are ways to incorporate it into your life. I will say, however, that if your immediate goal is to make a lot of money, art, a career in art will not give you that immediately. It takes a long, long time. It takes balance. And it probably won't make you a millionaire. But the rewards in terms of the emotional and um, the personal benefits are so much larger. So it's really a question of what do you want from your life? And at this point, I just want to talk about my children who I've raised, and they're now in their 20s, and two of them are working. And when I was raising them, and they, when they got to the point you are at, where they were deciding on their high school careers, uh, we were really torn because we were, my husband and I were, were raised very uh, conservatively, like, okay, get a career where you can make money, where you can you know, support yourself. But for me, it was like, I, I really want them to do what makes them happiest. Because if you're happy, then in your job, then you will probably be successful in it. That was just my thinking. Um, so here's what happened. So here, here are my kids. This is Matthew. He's the eldest. Ian is the one in blue. He's the middle child. And the youngest is Timmy. And when they were young, I um, really encouraged them to pursue whatever they wanted. If they're into video games, play video games, but no fighting games, please. If they're into art, I provided them with art materials. If they're into music, they had music lessons. And um, when they got into college, one of them decided to go into an arts degree at USC. He, he pursued a, a career in design. And um, first he, he wanted to go to a, an art school. And being our first son, we were like, can you please just go to a regular school and get a liberal arts degree, not a straight art school, and, and just um, get, your, get your BA, but we will support your, your life in the arts. And you know what? He was a skater. He loved to skateboard. And he ended up his first job at Baker Distribution in LA and designing skateboards. So yeah, these are some of his designs here on the right. He, um, so, so some of these really cool skaters like Jamie Foy, asked him to make a, a design just for him. So he made those designs. And so at one point I was thinking, you guys are really, really lucky. You're at a point in history where whatever you want to do, you can really study and become. That wasn't the case when we were young. We couldn't say, you know, me growing up in the Philippines, I couldn't say, I want to grow up and design skateboards or I want to do animation and make all these cool videos and put them on YouTube and be a, a YouTuber and people will follow me. and I mean, people are making money that way. It's crazy. And you know, my young, my middle son who liked video games, so he's the one here over on the left standing on that pad. It's Dance Dance Revolution. I don't know if you guys know that game, but he used to play that a lot as a kid. He is now working at um, uh, Riot Games, which makes the game League of Legends, if you know that game. And you know, he's the one I used to say, don't play any fighting games. And he played fighting games behind my back. And now he's working for a company that makes mainly fighting games. And um, he's just really happy. I mean, but he did work on it. He, he got his master's in computer science. He finished a degree in math first because he loves math. Didn't they after me, that's for sure. And so, you know, they followed their dreams and they made it happen. And so uh, what I'm saying is, if you have a particular passion in your life, and you study really hard, and you follow the path that you truly believe is what um, would make you feel most fulfilled, then you, it will eventually blossom for you. I mean, I, I don't want to be romantic and say, yes, if you're an artist, you just take art at art school and everything will open. No, you have to do the work. And by doing the work, um, this is what I mean. I'm gonna go to my next slide. So, oh, what happened? It disappeared there, do you see it? So, um, I have four keys to help you soar to your dreams. Do you see that slide? Is it? Yeah, we see it. Okay. So mm -hmm. S is for study hard, read, research, do your best you can, can to learn all you can about your field. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a field that, um, that you will be, that will be your main career. It could be 
you know, if you want to do art as a supplement to what your, your, your career will be eventually, then you could do that too on the side. You could attend poetry readings, you could go to art shows, you could follow artists on Instagram and learn from them while studying your main course. Like for me, when I was studying, I was still reading, I was still attending um, events that would support my art, but I was still, I was um, staying mainly focused on my career, which then was counseling psychology. Always support others in the artistic community. So you need to learn how to be a good citizen. And by that, I mean, it's not only about pursuing your own achievements, but also up, uh, we, we want to be able to lift up other people in the community too. Um, so attend their read, uh, other people's poetry readings, exhibits, go to their um, book launch, um, try, to, uh, try to support their work and promote it on social media. If you, if you really admire someone, then promote it, promote their work, um, buy their books if you can afford it. If not, then just share, you know, share that this person's book is out and you want to promote it and you really love the work that they do because that comes back to you. You know, I feel like the artist community is probably, people don't realize, I mean, certainly the government doesn't realize how important art is for, for the soul of a, of a society. And there's so much funding that's being taken away from the arts now. And so it's, about, it's, it's our responsibility as artists to support each other and to lift each other up in any way that we can, because who else will take care of us but each other. And so, when people ask me for help, like, can you write me a blurb for my book? Or can you please look at my manuscript? I'm always willing to, of course, d d based on whether I have the time, but I'm always like, if I can, I would, I always lift them up because there was someone before me who lifted me up and gave, opened the door for me. And A is ask for help. So this is uh, where it's really important to find a mentor, someone who will inspire you and guide you, someone who believes in your work, maybe a teacher or somebody in the community that you met, either like because you follow their work on Instagram or you've read their book or you've read poems of theirs that you like, and ask them, would you mind you know, giving me some tips? How can I, um, how can I further my interest in this? And where, where, what are some resources that I could, that I could um, avail of to, to pursue this, this dream of mine? And the, very mo the, mo the most important one for me is the last one, R, which is reinvent know that you can always change your mind and that we're always evolving in any stage of our lives. I mean, I published my first book, I was already in my 40s and my youngest son was already about to go to college. He was already in high school. It didn't stop me from, you know, thinking, oh, there's too many young people out there to compete with. I mean, we all have a story to tell and we have our own particular way of telling it. Nobody can tell your story. Only you can tell your story the way you tell your story. And it and everybody's voice is valuable. So I think I'll stop there for a minute and just open again to questions if there's any, any um, feedback or comments or clarification questions. All right, guys, so if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and I'll read them as they come in. Um, Angela, I do have a question for you though. So what has been the hardest obstacle that you've had to overcome thus far? I think the hardest obstacle so far is just um, the, it's really hard to, to silence the voice of the critic in me or the insecurities of being an artist in a world that's so competitive, that's so geared towards the young for one and because i started publishing much later and geared towards the dominant population not necessarily you know when i started writing it wasn't so in to like publish and to talk about or to highlight people of color now it's becoming more of the moment to be uh, to be aware that there are other voices there that need to be championed and it really took a lot of self um, like affirmation that this is important, what I'm doing, and that what really helped me was giving readings and having a Filipino a young student in the crowd come up to me and say, hey, I really like hearing that story about your mother, and maybe I can write a story about my mother too. Um, but it's, I won't lie, it's not an even playing field out there for women or, and for people of color. And also, 
for for older writers, older poets. I mean, you're all very young. You still have a lot of time ahead of you. In the end, it's just believing that my story counts and that I will find the audience that my writing speaks to. And if you write to what you really believe in, like if you write, if you make art, whatever you believe in is most important to you. I think that it breaks barriers. I think that writing from what, what means the most to us really connects us to human beings, no matter if we're black or white or yellow or brown or whatever. Inside, we're all the same. We're all human. And if we write to what's deeply meaningful to us, we will reach the people that we need to reach and who needs need to hear our voice. Okay, so the next question uh, comes from Judy. And Judy asked, uh, what is the best way to convince your parents that, uh, that or why a certain career choice is right for you, even when it's not what they expect? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I think that I would start by just having a very um, heart, having a heart to heart conversation with your parents and saying, this is, this is where my heart lies. This is, this is my passion. This is what I really want to do with my life. And, um, and having a plan, like, this is my plan. I've re do the research, do the research, look at, people who have succeeded in that career that you're planning to do. Um, how do they go about it? What, what schools do they apply to? What, what courses do they take? And say, this is my plan. I plan to do this. You know, you know lay out your plan. This, I, I plan to finish this degree. And truly, I think that if, if your parents understand that you're, you're committed to this degree, then they'll know that their investment was worth it because there's more likelihood that you would finish something that you enjoy rather than something that you're being forced to do. Isn't that a better investment of your money if you're, you know that you're investing in your child's education um, and it's something that they really, really want to do? That's how I felt about my children anyways. Like if, if my son really wants to do art, okay, then we'll, we'll, we'll try to get him into the best school that will prepare him for a career in art. Um, other than that, I think, you know, just you have to try to make a compromise with your parents. I mean, whatever they're saying that you must do and that you would like to do, maybe there's a way that you can come up with a compromise. Maybe you would say, okay, you want me to be an accountant? I will be an accountant and make money and then I will get my master's in, in fine arts when I'm done with, with my accounting. I mean, there are so many ways and there are also a lot of ways that you can learn stuff from the internet. Um, my youngest son, who was in CalArts and tried to take a leave from there this year, he was in music technology and he really wanted to be in animation, but he couldn't get into the animation. It was very, very competitive. And actually, in the time that he's been off of school, he's actually learned how to do animation just by studying programming on the internet and studying animation formats. And now he's making videos on YouTube that are um, animation and he's putting his music to it and um, putting his uh, writing and drawings. So there are always ways to, to figure out your path. So please don't give up. Talk to your parents. Be open. Tell them. Your, but but make, do the research and, and make your plan very clear to them. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I can tell you. Okay. Uh, next we have Shire. And Shire asked, uh, have you ever gotten reader's block? But I think she means writer's block. <laughs> writer's block, yes, a lot. <laughs> I have. Um, and a teacher once told me, writing is like being a farmer in a way, because sometimes farmers, you know, they let the field lie fallow for a year, meaning they don't plant on the field for a year so that it can get and become enriched again with rain and the soil allow it to become rich again so she said don't don't be worried about even if you're not writing for months or weeks it'll always come back your words will always be there um having said that i think that inspiration is overrated you don't just sit around with your pen and like okay inspiration hit me now because i have nothing to write about i think what helped me the most is writing a little bit every day even if i don't feel like it and even if it's um even if there's nothing then write about having nothing to write about and just get your pen moving every day writing in a journal this is mine i fill it every day with a few words and i and you know what's interesting is one word begets another you just keep writing 
So what's really helped me is having a group of writers and we, we tell each other we're going to write a poem a day for a month. And it doesn't have to be a great poem. It can be three lines. It can be five lines, ten lines. But by midnight, we need to send each other a poem. And you'd be surprised under pressure what you can create. Yeah, so just write a little every day and don't give up. Okay, Vanessa asked, if you were to continue in psychology or counseling field, how do you think your life would be different today? Oh, wow. Yeah, I wish I knew. I wish I had a crystal ball. I think about that a lot. Um, I think I'd be way stressed out. <laughs> um, I think I might have been able to learn it eventually. See, my problem was I was just too emotionally attached to my clients and I would cry when they cry. And it was hard for me to, to have that wall. And I didn't give myself enough years to learn how to build that distance. Um, and I learned eventually that that's what you need is you need to build that distance. So I think I may have learned to do that eventually. It would have taken a lot of energy and uh, it would also have taken me away from my children much longer than I had hoped that I, that, than I had wanted to. And, and they would have turned out differently. So in, in the end, I'm glad I stayed home and I raised my children to be who they are now because I'm really proud. I think they're my three best poems, my three best books, if you will. Um, but certainly I would have helped a lot of people through a counseling degree, but I feel that by helping my own children to reach the fulfillment that they've reached in their own lives, then, that's, then I'm also helping the world in that way. So yeah, thanks for that question though. It made me think a lot <laughs> about my um, life. So Madalena asked, did you ever feel discouraged? And if so, how did you overcome? Discouraged as a writer or? Yeah, I think she means in your career, in your life. Um, yes, a lot. I, uh, write, I think the hardest part was getting the first book out and sending, out, sending it out for three years, getting rejections every year from the same journals or saying, oh, you made finalists, but no, we're not going to this year. Um, being a writer or an artist, you have to get really used to rejection. You'll be getting a lot of rejections in the mail. And um, they, maybe for every one acceptance, you'll get 10 rejections. But you just keep sending that work out, believing in it. Um, at the very, at the, on the third year of sending my book out, Blood Orange, the first book, Don't even send your book to my publishing company. It's not good enough. It, it, we'll never publish a book like that. And I was devastated. I cried and I came home. I'm like, okay, my book is never going to get published. But another mentor said, don't give up on that book. It's done. It's a good book. Put it in your drawer. Work on your next book. Just keep sending it out. It's done. And, you know, almost on the same, um, on the trip home from that conference, I got I noticed that the book was a finalist for the Willow Books Prize, and then eventually it won the prize. So it really takes a thick skin um, for rejection, and it takes a lot of perseverance and belief in what you're doing um, to push through those, those, those difficulties and those insecurities. But um, if you're passionate about you, what you do and you do the work and you do those keys that I talked about, I think that um, anyone can succeed in, in the writing world or in the art world if they pursue it with as much heart and soul as 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 they can so yeah i hope that answers your question okay the next question comes from shire and she asked what is your favorite childhood book childhood book oh i love that thank you for asking that um i read a lot of books as a child even though they were all about white children growing up in places I'd never been, but I was just transported by them. Uh, I grew up in the Philippines. We didn't have public libraries, but we did have, I went to a private Catholic school and there, the nuns had stocked the shelves with books from England. Some of them were um, Enid Blyton books. I don't know if you read that anymore, but they were about these children who lived in a dormitory. They lived and, and they, they, ate scones which I had never tasted the scone I'm like what is that scone whenever it comes out everyone is so excited it must be delicious 
And I just, I tried to imagine what a scone was. I imagined it was some kind of cookie and then even taste it to like in the U.S. But anyway, yeah, I read Little House on the Prairie. I have so many great books that I remember. I read Anne of Green Gables, Little Women. My dad loved books and whenever he traveled, he would buy me books. And somehow he knew what little girls liked to read because he bought me those books. Um, I loved Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web, and um, The Trumpet of the Swan by E.B. White. I wish I had more stories by people of color like me, but that wasn't there growing up. But that's okay. Whatever you grew up with, that's your voice. Whatever language you have in your head, because that's what you read, that's your voice. Use it. Um, when I started writing, I'm digressing, but this is an interesting story. When I started writing in the U.S. and I was in poetry groups, people would say, why is your language like that? It sounds so romantic. It sounds like kind of British. It sounds a little bit too antiquated. It doesn't sound like normal English. And I said, well, it's because I grew up in the Philippines and I read what I could. It's That, that was the stuff that I, I grew up with and that's part of my voice. And so now you guys, you have the um, you have the luxury of having so much literature in front of you on the internet, um, libraries, I mean, just everywhere. And people from all over the world are writing now, and they have so many stories to tell. So just read widely, read whatever you can, what you can get your hands on, read from different cultures other than your own, and it will just open your mind and open your world. But yeah, those were some of, I mean, you read what you have, right? Like growing up, it's like I read what was, in, what, what, was um, what was available to me. Thanks for that question. Anyone else? I love Thank all your you. questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jill asked, what are you reading now? I'm reading a lot of poetry. Um, this is Rhino. So Rhino is a, uh, we published this yearly. It's a, it's a editorial, uh, it's, it's an annual liter literary journal out of Chicago that I used to be an, uh, that I'm still an editor of, but I was more active when I lived in Chicago. We publish almost a hundred poets a year and I'm just reading all of them again. Because now that I'm living in South Florida, I don't get to join the meetings as much as I used to. And usually what we do is we sit around a big table, we eat pizza and we vote on the poems that will come into the journal. And I don't get to do that anymore. Now I just um, I just do their reviews. I, I um, edit Rhino reviews. We review books of other authors. So I'm reading um, this this journal right now. It's a hundred pages. Um, I don't read a lot of fiction because I ha I'm always having to read poetry. Um, but for my work, from for the magazine that I edit. But recently, let's see. I started reading again. A book by Nabokov, uh, Speak Memory, it's his memoir. I'm sure some of you know that he wrote the book Lolita. I don't know if that's allowed for high school kids to read now, but he, he wrote a beautiful memoir called uh, Speak Memory about his childhood in Russia. I'm reading that now. Okay, so you have a few more questions here. Um, so what has been your greatest accomplishment and how many hours a day do you write? I kind of combined two questions there. <laughs> okay. Uh, my greatest accomplishment in the writing field, it would definitely be this third book that's coming out in 2021 from Four Way Books, which is a large publisher of poetry in New York. Um, I consider it my greatest accomplishment because I had a really hard year this past year. In May of last year, my mother passed away, and then shortly after, my father died in June. So that was two in a row. It was really tough, 11 days apart. I came back to the US, and a publisher who had been my teacher in uh, my MFA just out of the blue emailed me and said, what do you have? Do you have something to show me? Do you have a, a manuscript? I said, I said, well, I have some work, but it's not, it's not completed yet. She said, just show me what you have when you can. I know this is a hard time, but I, I'd like to see. And I said, okay. And then I, of course, put it aside because I was still grieving then for my parents. And I happened to call my friend, who's also a poet and an editor. And I said, hey, four-way books called me. They said they wanted to look at my manuscript. She said, so did you send it? I said, um, I probably will in a month or so. She said, are you crazy? Get off your butt and write that book and send it tomorrow. Because this is a huge opportunity for you. She said, I will help you. I said, but I'm so depressed. I can't write. And she said, 
you have the poems, you can order them, put them in an order, send them to me tomorrow, and I will help you edit this manuscript. This is my friend. And then you will send it to Martha of Four Way Books. And she did. I know I, I worked on it. She said, you know, poetry will save your life. It will get you out of the hole that you're in. And it did. And that's why I really, I really think that, you know, art is really what will save us. I believe this totally. Um, I finished the book. I sent it to my publisher and she said, I really like this book. I will publish it next year. And I was so grateful. I didn't realize that, you know, a month after my parents died that I would be able to come up with this book and push through you know, the, the difficulty of losing them and, and dealing with all of the grief and mourning. Um, so yeah, that would, that, that would be up there among my bigger accomplishments. And in the second part, how many hours a day do you write? Oh, it varies because you know, I have a life too and I have a, a family that I, I still worry about even though two of them live in California now. Um, most of the time I try, if I can even put in 15 minutes in the morning, I can, I consider that a big accomplishment. And then if I can recap at night and look at it again, and sometimes if I get fired up, I'll end up writing for an hour or two hours until it's already like early morning and I'm still writing at my computer. But some days, 15 minutes is all I get, but I really try every morning to be first thing in the morning, try to get some morning pages in, um, on a on a good day, I would say the most I could write is three to four hours, and then I have to like take a break, do yoga, do some exercise, get walk my dog, and then do the things around the house that I, I normally have to do. Okay, and the last question I see here asked, what was your favorite memory in the Philippines of growing up in the Philippines? Favorite memory? Oh, for sure it would be the food, the lumpia and the green mango with uh, bagoong. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's this really salty shrimp paste that you eat with green mangoes. Oh my God. And walking around my neighborhood, I see so many green mangoes in these big trees in my neighbor's house. And I wish I could pick them all because nobody's eating them. <laughs> green mangoes for sure. Um, I miss my mom's cooking so much because she loved food and food was her language of love. She would make um, the best apple pie, believe it or not. She learned how to make apple pie in the Philippines. Um, she had this soup every Christmas called chestnut soup that had um, chestnuts. Yeah. Um, and uh, chicken broth and all kinds of good, good uh, vegetables and chicken mixed in there. She made paella. Definitely would be food. Sorry, it must be getting close to uh, my afternoon snack. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> yeah, definitely the food of the Philippines for me is the best. Any more questions? I I'm curious. Can I ask these students a question? Can I ask how many are you, of you are considering a, a career in the arts or even in writing or any art? Okay, and while they already typed that, um, Shire wants to know what kind of dog do you have? Oh, Phoebe, we have a dog. Well, I want to show her to you. Can I show you my dog? Yeah. <laughs> this is my dog, Phoebe. She's also my writing muse. She's always like in my office when I'm writing. This is my office and she stays here with me all day long, lying on the couch, and just chilling out with me. And she yeah, forced me to stay on my chair and write. She's a cockapoo, so half poodle, half cocker spaniel. <laughs> You're getting a lot of compliments in the chat right now. Everyone's saying she's cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's more she's more popular than I am on Facebook. She gets more likes <laughs> than I do. <laughs> uh, okay, so Shire commented. She said that she likes to draw. Ooh, good for you. Two of my sons love to draw. You know, my fourth, uh, my oldest son, he didn't know he wanted liked drawing until he was in third year in college. He broke up with his girlfriend. He got really depressed. And suddenly all his art started blooming. Like, where did that come from? I mean, he's always liked to draw, but he wasn't really that serious about it. And then he, he's the one who ended up being the skateboard designer. And now he works for the toy department of Warner Brothers. He's designing um, stuff for Harry Potter and um game of thrones so yeah you just never know you just just never know okay and then ariana said that she likes to write about her life experiences wonderful wonderful um yeah there's just 
so much of that memoir is really big now. Memoir is I think, even easier to publish than poetry, I believe. But read whatever memoirs that you can. Um, there's so many out there. Read um, certain poets that write about their life experiences that I know. Um, I wish I could put together, maybe I could put together a reading list and you could give it to your students next time you meet with them. I don't have it to me at the top of my head, but I'd love to make a, a reading list for them in terms of like what poets they could read and what, I mean, if, you, if they're interested in the current writing, who they should be reading. Absolutely, that is a great idea. We definitely can use that. Okay, I'll send you a, a, a list next, for, for next week. Okay, then you have two more. So Ruth says, I have considered a career in the arts and I hope to allow more inclusivity and representation in the fashion community. I enjoy many forms of art also. And then you have a comment from Erin who said, as for your question, I want to say I lean interest into technology since I was young, but my core skills come from socializing from different adults I've met since about eight or seven. This was when I was exposed to online gaming and learned about the outside life. So sociology is my best course. Okay, so she was interested in, in technology. And then- So that's Erin. So Erin's interested in technology and, um, now he's mm -hmm. saying sociology is his core, and then Ruth is saying that she wants to um, make draw in inclusivity or representation in the fashion community. That's wonderful. Those are both excellent goals, and I'm very excited for you. I have a niece who's in the fashion um, in FIT studying fashion now, and she made a dress out of paper, a paper fans. Um, and in terms of gaming, my son, who's in the gaming industry, he's in touch with a lot of gamers in the Philippines who are also like doing their own startups in gaming. It's really exciting. Um, but what's so cool about your core being sociology is that I think that a lot of these interactive games, they there's a lot of um, knowledge that's required of human nature and human interaction, and it's all it's becoming so much more relevant now to have other um, fields like of knowledge that to put into the gaming industry and to make sure that it's inclusive, that there are people of color, that there are people of various, you know, um, uh, th that sexual identities are represented um, and even size, weight, all of that. I mean, because they're representing the real world in some way. So it's important to make that world represented and inclusive. Um, yeah. Another thing that was inspiring to hear when I went to my son's uh, orientation was that a liber liberal arts ed education now is actually be becoming more valuable even in the business world because of the necessity for content in, on the internet and on so many platforms um, for writers, for artists, for people who know how to, for social media. Um, so, I think that being an artist, you're trained to use divergent thinking. You're not just like trained to look in one specific way, but you're 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 used to finding creative solutions, and that's very very valuable in the business world as well and in other fields as well. Any more questions? All right, let me double check and make sure. All right, I think that's all we have. Well, uh, Angela, I want to thank you so much for coming to speak to our career bounce students today. We appreciate your time during this pandemic that we're facing right now. We really appreciate you coming uh, to speak to all of us. Um, okay. Bobby, I know that you have some last minute um, announcements. So Bobby, you can take over. Yes, so I'm gonna send you guys the survey. Shire said to tell your dog I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, hi, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, baby. And Angela, many students are saying um, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for listening, and I hope it was helpful. And he, um, if you have any more questions, feel free to course them through Anna, and I will I, I will again send some resources through them next week to give you more um, reading material that you might be able to look at. Thank you. Okay. Good luck, right. Thank you, Angela. All right. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today.